This is 51st Dates, and I'm your host, Jolie Moore. They say that hindsight is 2020. I decided to find out if that's true. Every week, I'm going to read a chapter from my memoir, 51st Dates, then give you the backstory and commentary on what really went down. It's been two whole years since I went on these dates, and I'll be experiencing them along with you as I read. We'll find out together if my future self learned anything. I don't know if I have anything figured out, but at least we'll share some laughs along the way. Dating in Southern California is nothing if not entertaining. Ready? Strap in. Let's go. Welcome to 51st Dates. This is episode 49. I can't believe I've done 48 others of this show. You know, there has been a lot of growth between the beginning of this when I started recording um, at the end of December, beginning of January of 2021, and now where we are in December 2021. It is frankly, well, both shocking and good. Um, The shocking part is that If you had told me in January 2021 that there was a lot of growth ahead, I might not have believed it. Um, But being where I am now, it feels so much better than where I was then. Um, So, you know, I'm not in a relationship. I'm not dating. But what I think I've learned over the year, um, I guess I broke up. Wait, no. No, I haven't dated in a long time. I can't even remember. I broke up with that guy in 2020 and then the new guy. Okay. Um, And what I've learned is what it's like to be alone for the most part. There's always like guys hovering. So it's not as if there is no male attention in my life ever, but there's no significant sort of relationship that I'm in working toward avoiding, dealing with whatever. Um, It's just been me sort of being me. And that has been a super interesting period. I don't think that I have been out of a relationship from the time I graduated high school until now. Like, even though there are many points in my life where I had no intention to date, and I specifically was moving into a situation, new city, new school, new whatever, with no intention to date, 15, I swear to God, 15 seconds after I got there, I was in a thing. Um, It happened time and time again. And I think that if I had been more intentional, if I had thought to myself, oh, there will be men there and they will hit on you and you will succumb to one of them, then maybe I would have been more intentional in whom I chose rather than just going with the guy I thought was cute at the time and who was like asking me out. Um, because what that has ended up with is years and years and years of that same pattern. The whole pursuing guy that I'm like, hey, you pursued me, now I'm in. And they're like, hey, who are you again? It was the craziest pattern and I think that once and for all I feel like I've broken it one the biggest lesson I've learned this year is so there's the guy hovering and there's a guy I talk to every day I just looked it up I've talked to him every day of the last 104 days with no miss he always reaches out even when he's super busy and one of the things I've learned about that is that He has showed genuine, sustained interest, and he may not be interested in dating me. I really actually don't know. Um, Everybody says that he is, and I'm just oblivious, and that's also possible. But I I think I talked to him about relationships because I wasn't planning to date him. In the beginning, that I wanted to be intentional. I wanted to have a period of growth. I wanted to have like a hiatus from the craziness involved, and also I still needed to break it off with somebody. And... He didn't say anything about that. He's just like, you know, every day he's like, hey, how are you doing? How's this thing in your life? He remembers details. You know, we talk on the phone usually once a week. I don't have that a lot of time to talk on the phone because stuff. And it has been one of the most interesting sort of growth periods to sort of have 
a relationship that's very consistent. He's consistent. He's not running around telling me I'm the best thing ever and then disappearing for three weeks uh, because I've experienced a lot of that. Or even when they're physically present, just suddenly going from hot, you're the best, to emotionally unavailable but in a space with you, which I'm going to be honest, is one of the loneliest things in the world. So that's been the huge lesson. And I don't know what's going to happen there because there's a lot of logistical issues. Um, but um, it'll be interesting going forward. So I'm going to spend some time with him in the next few weeks, seeing what that's like spending time with somebody who has been consistently interested in my life, if not interested in me romantically. Who knows? I guess I'll find out. Or I won't. And we'll just be like great friends. and That'll be fine. It, actually, that'll be fine. Like that will be fine. I don't need him to like fall at my feet or worship me, or do any of these things. Just having a consistent male presence in my life of somebody who just sort of gets me has been the best thing ever. Um, It has made me regain, um, not trust so much as faith, that men can be consistent and be kind without a side agenda whatever that is. I've met one with every kind of agenda. Some of them, I still am to this day wondering the agenda, but that has been one of the biggest godsends of the year. Other than that, I can't believe I'm getting to the end of the year and the end of this uh, memoir. Um, I'm about to read you chapter 49. I think, usually I don't remember what the chapters are about. I'm pretty sure I remember what this chapter is about. And here we go. Chapter 49, Upon Reflection, December 29. On the Thursday before Sunday, I got a text from Thunderbolt. After a week of crying and feeling sorry for myself, I was chilling between therapy, which makes me feel zen, and looking up where to send a couple of my designer purses for repair. I was sitting on my dining room banquette and had my feet up while I was filling time between my morning and the Boxing Day afternoon matinee of Jitney a Tony Award-winning August Wilson revival that was downtown at the Mark Taper Forum. Thunderbolt. Hey, sorry, holidays got crazy. Me? Hope you had a great Christmas. Thunderbolt. Pretty mellow. You? Me? On the whole, pretty good. I don't have my kid for Xmas break, so a lot of catch-up work and writing. Thunderbolt. Nice. Home today? How about an afternoon rendezvous? Me, I'm running out the door right now to see a play, the Tony <laughs> winning revival of Jitney, if later then sure. Thunderbolt, okay, I'll hit you up later. Usually I'd tell him when I'm home and he'd show up five minutes later. I didn't text because I was still on the fence about how I was going to approach my friends with benefits with having feelings. I'd written him off and with one text he'd pull me back in. I wanted to kiss him and kill him at the same time. That didn't feel like the right mindset. On Sunday though, I was ready. Me, Busy later. Want to hang out? Thunderbolt? Yes. Let's hang. When's good? Me? Eight. Finished writing early today. Thunderbolt? Cool. Yep. Would you like a beverage? I asked when he made himself comfortable on one of the kitchen stools of the breakfast bar. Nah, I'm good. Nearly every time Thunderbolt comes to my apartment, he does a little tour, noting what's changed since last there. First, he picked up my holiday card. It was the last one I'd planned to save for prosperity along with some extra envelopes. It's a picture of me and my son taken by a professional photographer in Griffith Park in the fall. Who is this? Seriously? I looked from him to the card in his hand. It's me and my son. He held the card closer for greater scrutiny. It doesn't look like you. Maybe because I don't see you smile often. The card looks exactly like me. After thinking about it, I'm pretty sure I saw him that night, not two or three hours after that picture was taken. I let that go because I already knew it was going to be a weird night. Then he picked up the top of my butter dish. Let me tell you about this butter dish. It's red. It's like Crusade. I bought it from Macy's when I moved to West Hollywood because I left the butter dish with my ex. Every single time he comes over, he brings up two things. How, my, how neat my living space is and this damned butter dish. I can't believe this butter dish, he said. What is it about the dish? It's like Crusade. It's a butter dish. It's signaling. What am I signaling with a red ceramic butter dish? That it's expensive. One issue that comes up between us time and again is income disparity. 
I earn more than he does, probably significantly more. When a friend was talking about an article she'd read about Thunderbolt and the Hollywood Reporter or Rolling Stone, she mentioned that he'd gone broke making his movie and that the women who were dating him dumped him. I haven't read the article because I, if I take even a shallow dive into his public life, I'll go in and never come out. It's the same reason I avoided Googling Classic Car Guy until we broke up. I can become obsessive about researching people. I'd rather have them tell me about themselves. When I first met Thunderbolt, he mentioned that he was embarrassed to be his age, now 43, and living in a small rent control studio. I now know he sold his car because he needed the money. My my friend said it was in the news feature. He said that his biggest fear was becoming like his half-brother in Baltimore, who's both, in his words, not mine, fat and marginally employed. I like nice things and I buy them for myself. I like to travel to foreign countries and go to nice restaurants and the theater. I'm not going to say that these things intimidate him because I don't assume to understand anyone's feelings. I'll just say that he talks about my lifestyle often, the fundamental argument against which is best encapsulated by this butter dish. This money discussion can sometimes go off the rails, and because I was nervous about the talk I wanted to have with him, I cut it short by suggesting we just go to bed, which we did. What I've always liked about Thunderbolt is that he's a generous lover, like seriously giving and good. Tonight wasn't his most generous. I didn't push it either because I was too busy being nervous about telling him about my feelings after the sex. I deliberately didn't tell him before because I knew after talking to him it may be the last time we had sex. After the sex, we lay in my bed and talked about movies he'd recommend for me. We talked about the book I'm writing now and some of the other books I've written. He, a- he often asks such specific questions that I wonder if he's putting together a dossier. My ex never asked a thing about me, so I'm not used to a man's interest in my life. Anyway, the conversation drifted until I ended up talking about the slow speed wreck of a conversation I witnessed. It's a story I sometimes tell. It was one of the most fascinating peeks into other people's lives that I've ever witnessed. About five years ago, I was writing in a coffee shop after I dropped my son off at kindergarten. Sometimes I camped out for an hour to avoid bad traffic. If I left after drop-off, I'd be on the road for an hour. If I waited for an hour, the ride home would only be 20 minutes. Writing always trumped driving for me. It was a tiny coffee shop with a few tables, but close to his school. I pulled up, went in, and ordered myself a latte, then took my laptop to the back and set up to write. Before I could get into my book, a man took the seat next to me. I probably noticed him because he was nervous, fidgeting, moving the table around, moving his coffee around, getting up, getting a large ice water after he'd already gotten coffee. It was in an area of Los Angeles where no one dresses up, so his button-down shirt and blazer were an anomaly. Eventually, a woman joined him. She was attractive but super casual. Southern California is casual, but even in a jeans culture, there are layers of casual. There's like the button-down blazer and blazer casual like him. Then there are sweats and t-shirts a woman might wear on laundry day. It was this woman's laundry day and a no makeup day and a put her hair up in a bun on the top of her head day. The man gets her coffee, then he leans in. Let's call them Julio and her Elizabeth. Elizabeth, I think we could have a great future together. I just bought a house, my job is stable. I think it's time to settle down. Elizabeth looked like she wished she'd already drunk the coffee in her hand and maybe another and a better night's sleep and somewhere to run. She had that deer in the headlights look that made even me uncomfortable. She leaned away as far as a straight back chair would let her lean. I'm still in college, Julio, she started. I'm not sure where I'm going in life. It went on like this for a good half hour. I got no writing done because I may have been live texting it for a group of writer friends. The best thing about writer friends, they're avoiding writing too and are almost always available for a good group text session. For some reason, I was telling the story to Thunderbolt. So what's the guy like, he asked. Ernest, I shrugged. That's the best description. No, like in a scale of one to 10, what was he? I don't know, maybe five or six, I said. But maybe not for her. Maybe he had some other qualities that made him super attractive to her. Didn't sound like it, Thunderbolt said while he stretched his naked leg in the air. Do you know the advice single women receive that I've received about five times in the last week? What? That we should consider dating men that we find less attractive because attraction can grow. Are you serious? I think you have to start high because attraction only wanes in a relationship. That was an interesting take to say the least. I had to wonder where that put me, but I didn't ask. I turned to him, propped myself up my elbow so I could see him better. So what are you? Me? On a scale of one to ten. If it's only looks, I'm a pretty good looking guy, so I'd say eight. But if other stuff is included, then? 
look, I'm good looking, I'm incredibly funny and really creative, I'm chill but driven, I'm really good at sex. With that whole package, I'm a solid nine out of 10. Now in my brain, I'd promised myself I'd have that talk about feelings with him. What in the hell could I say to that? But I promised myself, so I looked him in the eye. I might agree with that assessment. Before you go, I have to talk to you. I promised myself I'd do this so. So we got dressed, him in clothes, me in pajamas. We walked back into the kitchen. What do you want to say? Here's the thing. I stuttered to a stop, regrouped. I think I caught feelings for you. I know this fucks up the thing we have going, but I had to say it. I think that's the difference between men and women, he said. That's not true, I said. It was fine for months until it wasn't. This casual thing, he gestured around my apartment where 99% of our situationship had taken place, is all that's going to happen. Right? Okay, I said. I knew those words were coming. He'd said as much many times. I'd had to discount his behavior and only listen to what he said. I hope you're still dating, that this hasn't stopped you from finding someone, he added. I've been dating the whole time. You know that. He'd asked me about it enough times. And I didn't mind that. I told you that. There was nothing more to say. I wanted to go outside and have sushi with him, spend more time with him. He didn't want that. Impasse was the word for that one. Well, do you want some fruit before you go? I asked because he was eyeing the bowl of berries on my counter. Sure. He popped one or two in his mouth. This is good. Different. What is it? I don't know. It was on a display at the store. Threw away the package. I think you need to reflect, he said, looking me in the eye. On what? If you want to continue to do this casual thing. It's fine. We can... You're not leaving town for a few weeks. I thought maybe he interrupted me. If after reflections you want to do this again, just hit me up. I'm always in the neighborhood. I decided that there was nothing else to say. So I stood and started walking toward the mudroom. He followed. Have a happy new year, I said. Enjoy your family-friendly party. He mentioned being invited to a party with kids. He figured he'd be back home before midnight. I opened the back door for him since he's, he'd driven. Then he pulled me in for a kiss on the way out. Not a goodbye kiss like most times, but a kiss like he was going to stay, like he was going to see me again. I wasn't thrilled with his parting words, but I am reflecting. According to everything I'm reading, I need to clean him out of my life in order to bring someone new in. It was lesson eight. Lesson of the day from calling in the one, seven meets to attract the love of your life. I needed to heed the author's words. I called on all my friends because it was hard. Hard letting him go is probably the right thing for my sanity. Hard because I want nothing more than to call him over and have more wine and more chat and more of the kind of sex we'd perfected. Hard because I was alternating between meditation and spinning and yoga and crying. I put before you their words of wisdom. Pierce, my painter friend from the art show and ill-fated date with the hiker. I say good for you. I know it must have been very hard, not intellectually, but emotionally, physically. Stay strong. You don't need to bring people into 2020 that you are unable to love you the way you need to be loved. Trust, honor, respect, partnership, equality, love. The movie producer. I'm guessing you know this and it doesn't take away the hurt, but his inability to have an adult relationship has nothing to do with you or your value and everything to do with him the bestseller. I'm sorry. I know that's not what you were hoping for. I can't help believe there's a new guy out there, one you haven't met yet, who's ready for what you want. I think you can have sex and chat with Thunderbolt without stunting your growth, as long as you don't let it stop you from seeing other people. It's only bad if it's taking up space that should be filled by what you really want. But that seems like a down-the-road decision. Sex and chatting with the friend with benefits while you date other lovely men seems very reasonable. And when one of those lovely men takes your attention away from the FWB guy, you can finally kiss him goodbye. Expect him to want a serious thing with you then, though. It's him, not you. You don't have to figure him out. Just recognize his behavior and don't let it throw you. It's okay for us to do things that just feel good and trust that grown-ass men can look out for themselves. The Traveler. From Taiwan, she texted. You're not trash, so don't let anyone treat you like that. You're fucking amazing, smart, interesting, and have so much to give. Please know that. Thunderbolt might be great, but he obviously can't recognize or respect all you have to offer. I'm so glad you're having that hard talk with him. Bravo. I love you, friend. You're not alone. It's so funny because I actually just talked to that friend like five minutes ago. Um, On my way home, I was driving and we were chatting. Um, I I still actually talk to all of those friends. Um, (laughs) I still talk to every one of them. I mean, they've been friends for years. And that was hard. 
that was hard. So one of the things I guess I didn't put in here is when he was leaving out of my back door, I was like, I really said to him goodbye. And he was like, so you're not going to see me again. And I was like, that's my plan. My plan is to not see you again. And that's what I think when he may have said the thing about the whole hit me up or whatever. I don't know. I cut some of the conversations short because obviously they're way longer than that. And I literally had a plan not to see him again. So at this point in the podcast, I'm going to reveal that, of course, I saw him again. And he's the person I've been talking about who's been in and out. And I finally broke it off for good in September. I have not talked to him since the last week in September or whenever that was, maybe the first week in October. And I'm super, super, super proud of myself. I've not reached out. I have not done a single thing. (sighs) What happened was, so he walked out the door. It was literally December 29th. I went out two days later, which was New Year's Eve with a friend, drank way too much, cried, 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 felt sad, cried. And I spent like part of January feeling sad. And then I went on some other dates and felt less sad. But one of the things that happened after this is he texted me. So let's say I believe it was the beginning of February and I was dating somebody else and that guy was being weird and whatever. So he texts and I don't know what the text says. I'd have to go look it up and I certainly don't want to do that now. As if we had not had the conversation and we had like a little bit of back and forth and eventually he invited himself over and we started up again. And (laughs) he walks into my house. I know this. And the first thing he says is you haven't changed. And I thought, it's been like six weeks. Like, how much change am I going to have in six weeks? And he hadn't changed. But for reasons that I'll never know, because, well, we've, well, I probably do know now, he wasn't ready to let it go. And I really, really wanted to let it go, but I was really weak. He's really good looking and he's really funny and smart. There's a lot of things I really liked about him. Um, and I just wasn't ready to let it go. And it went on all of 2020 (laughs) and part of 2021. And um, it was a lot. It was a lot. There was a lot of ping ponging back and forth. And he was like, we should have more of a relationship. I'm like, okay. And then he disappears. And then he comes back and he's like, I was a little weird. I'm not going to disappear again. I'm like, okay. And then he promptly disappears right after that. So all that said, we get to September of this year and I was finally ready to be done. I was also sort of ready to be done in May, but I, I guess I wasn't. I felt ready to be done in May and I was crying about him again. And come September, I was like, no, no, no. Once and for all, I'm done. So I saw him a few times um, after I came back um, from Europe for the summer. And when I saw him the last time, it was, it was to be frank, The first time maybe I saw him clearly, I'm not sure. But I sat there with him. We sat around for hours. And all I could think of is, oh my God, I think he's right. I think we're fundamentally incompatible. Um, Some other stuff happened before that. That was on his part. I feel unkind, but I will stay out of that muck. But it was, I sat there with him in September and I thought, we're not incompatible. So I will tell you this. He moved. And one of the things I did is I got him, I got him a housewarming present. Actually, I got him a couple of gifts, but that's just, I sometimes get gifty. I get gifty on the way out <laughs> of relationships. I really do. And what I did is I went online and I ordered him exactly the same butter dish that I have, but in a different color. I got, got wrapping paper. It was very elaborate. When I rolled up to his new place, I gave him the butter dish, which by the way, he really liked. Don't think he got the joke. I don't think he was conscious that every time he was at my place, he mentioned that damn butter dish. So I got him the butter dish. He's like, oh my God, it's like Crusade. This is so amazing. Yada, yada. Whatever. I don't even know if he eats butter because LA. So I got him the dish or whatever. And we sat there and I think I asked him a lot of questions because I was just trying to figure out what I liked about him. Like it, it, it took a long time for that feeling to go away, but it finally had. And I sat there looking at him and I was like, we're fundamentally incompatible. You don't have your crap together. I do, to the extent I have my crap together. And we're like living in different life spaces. And I think we're done. And 
it, we, well, we did have the sex, but because, you know, because it was going to be, because that's the last time I had sex. It's going to be a long dry spell, and I knew that. But for the first time, I was able to walk out the door and know that I was not going to go back. And, you know, he had all these things. He's like, we should do this and we should do that. And all I thought was, no, nope, never. I'm not going to call you. I'm not going to text you. I'm not going to buy you gifts. I'm not going to drop your crap off at your house, especially since they moved. But it was, it was freeing. And I'm not going to say that I don't think about him because I do still think about him from time to time. I do not Google him. He had a movie premiere. I did not go. I did not look up to see what his box office numbers were. Like I was really, I have been really, really, really good about not following what's going on in his life. Um, I had muted him on social media a long time ago. So I know we're still friends on social media because I was messaging somebody on Facebook and he popped up as like Thunderbolts online. I was like, oh, fuck this guy. But I mean, we're still friends on social media probably. I don't know but he's muted. So there's no way in which information about him comes into my life. And COVID makes that way easier because I don't see nearly the number of people anymore. We didn't have a lot of people in common to begin with, but I don't hear like tales about him in the Hollywood Reporter or him in Rolling Stone or him in whatever, you know, entertainment thing there is um, locally. And my friends know not to say anything. So that was the hardest part of the last, oh my God, three, almost three years of my life. And uh, I want to say I learned a lot from it. Um, I think I learned that I needed to stop having men in my life who took me for granted, who had no interest in having a full and real relationship with me. There was guys after this, so it wasn't like a perfect lesson, but I think I finally learned it. And it's the best thing I learned in 2021. I'm ashamed that I saw him after 2019. <laughs> I mean, I saw him during the pandemic. I mean, we got like COVID tests together. I mean, whatever. Got vaccinated at the same time. Whatever. I um, can't we got COVID tests together. Like how creepy, creepy is that? Like in my age, it was like, let's get tested for STDs together. And then with him, it was like, let's get tested for COVID together. Because he was on set a lot and... We're not going to get into the whole thing in LA, but being on set with the COVID people is hit or miss. Some sets were really tight about like COVID and some were really loose. And he was on some of the looser sets because they were filming in places that were less COVID serious, like Nevada and well, other states, Texas, and I don't know where else we went, where there were way fewer restrictions so they could film um, more easily. But that also meant that there were sometimes looser restrictions on set. So that was that. And I'm super proud of myself for not reaching out. One of the things that I know is that eventually he will reach out, probably around Christmas time, because that seems to be the time of year, doesn't it? Um, And I think the likelihood that he'll reach out is probably like 50%. It's probably, it's not zero. I don't think it's zero. And at that time, I will have to assess how I'm going to react and any kind of reaction I have, because he has a way of sort of just, acting as if we've had no conversations and we can just go back to where we are or or in the alternative he found somebody to marry and have his babies and that's what he's busy doing i honestly don't know i don't know if he got to 45 without that who knows but i'm super proud of having put a pin finally on the end of that relationship i wish it had been december 29 of 2019 but instead it was september 2021 It's the best thing I ever did for myself this year, and it helped me experience great growth, and I have almost no regrets. I'm Jolie Moore, and this has been 51st Dates, the podcast. If you enjoyed listening, I hope you'll share, rate, and review it on Apple Podcasts. It will help others find the craziness that is dating in Southern California. Also, please hit the subscribe button on your podcast app. If you'd like to read ahead, my memoir, 50 First Dates, is available wherever books are sold. A link is always included in the show notes. I'm also a romance writer. If you want to know more about my books, please visit joliemore.com for more information. You can also follow me on Instagram at xojoliemore and on all social media at the same handle, xojoliemore. 
Thanks for listening, and I'll be in your ears next week.